Welcome back to the 6th Gear Garage. Today I'll show how to replace all the coolant hoses on the 1FZ FE engine of the 80 series Land Cruiser, including the dreaded pesky heater hose. I'll also show how to bypass the rear heater, whose metal lines often rust and can't be replaced without removing the entire transmission. This should be long and not fun. First, I need to slide under and remove the front skid plate. I've got a bolt here, a bolt here, a bolt here, and a bolt here, all 12 millimeter. Once that's off, I can look up in here and somewhat hidden, there it is, the petcock valve. Not enough room to crack it loose with my fingers, but with a pair of channel locks, I can get in between those pipes. I'm able to grip the left half of the petcock and get it loosened, just a little bit. Now I can turn it by hand. I've got my bucket ready. Just keep loosening it with my finger. It's a pretty tight area to work in back here. All right. I didn't take the petcock all the way out. I just loosened it a bit. That way I get a, a controlled stream into the bucket instead of coolant gushing all over. Take the cap off. That way I'll get a better flow if air can replace the coolant that's leaving the system. Eh, it's mostly in the bucket. While that drains, let's take a look at the first hose here. I'll end up typing all these part numbers in the description for you. I got these from Wits End because they sell them as kits. So I started with radiator hose number one and used vice grips to release the factory hose clamp up top, but ended up needing channel locks to move the lower clamp because of its location. A soup can was perfect for catching the rest of the coolant in the upper hose. Then I used the channel locks to remove the factory clamps from the hose because the jaws of the vice grips didn't open wide enough after the clamp had squeezed down on the empty hose. After the clamps were on the new hose, I put a little coolant on the openings to help the hose slide on and put the clamp on the end of the hose. The top of the hose wasn't sliding all the way on the radiator neck, so I dripped a little more coolant on to help it slide into place. Next up we have radiator hose number two and radiator hose number three. These guys go way down in here. You can see one right there next to the AC compressor. That's number three and it connects to the bottom of the radiator. And if you look at the thermostat housing, that's number two that attaches to that. By the way, if you need more light in the engine bay, I just bungee corded a four foot LED shop light to the underside of the hood. And this is plenty of light. First, I needed more room to work. So I removed the fan and radiator shroud. However, learn from my mistake here and install hose two and three before number one, because I had to remove number one from the radiator in order to remove the radiator shroud. I removed the pair system to get some additional room as well. Then the fan and shroud came right out. Now I can get some pliers on the clamp there. However, when I took out the shroud, I did have to remove the upper hose here. So don't get ahead of yourself like I did. And this is radiator hose three. And it runs back to that water pipe there, which then goes to two and then to the housing. I already replaced the thermostat less than a year ago, so I'm not gonna take this off today, but normally this is the ideal time to replace the thermostat as well. And make sure to order the rubber gasket along with the OEM thermostat because it wasn't included. I'll have part numbers for those in the description. Next, I got to work removing hose number three from the radiator neck. And then hose number two. The clamp was giving me some trouble, but a little lube helped it slide right down. So, if I go under the front of the truck here, 
there's a bracket that supports the water pipe and it's held on with two 12 millimeter nuts or actually a nut and a bolt it's going to be easier to pull out both hoses and the pipe as one unit and I was able to reach those with just a long extension. Unbolting the bracket for the metal water pipe gave the hoses plenty of wiggle room and I was able to push number two off of the thermostat housing and eventually twist and pull number three off of the lower radiator neck. Then I pulled the whole assembly up through the front of the engine bay. Next, I brought everything over to the workbench to replace both of the hoses. Notice I'm marking the orientation of the hoses before removing the old ones so I can be sure the new hoses are aligned the exact same way. The new hoses come with white marks to help get them lined up properly as well. I dropped the pipe and hose assembly down into the bay and noticed that there was some corrosion on the thermostat housing neck that needed to be cleaned off with steel wool and a wire brush. But it was hard to clean all the corrosion around the neck with the thermostat cover installed, so I ended up removing it anyways. It's held on with three 12 millimeter nuts. So that's how I would have replaced the thermostat if I needed to do so. The three nuts get torqued to 15 foot pounds. Next, I wiped some coolant on the end of hose number two to help it slide onto the thermostat cover neck and did the same to help hose number three slide onto the lower radiator neck. Then I used the channel locks to slide and wiggle the clamps into place. Okay, that was a decent amount of work. Hose number two is complete and hose number three is complete. After all that, I need to do something simple. How about this guy? This is the coolant bypass hose. 99555-10200 and it's one of four hoses in the uh, little hose kit from Wits End. This was the easiest one to replace out of all the hoses on the engine. A relaxing two minutes before I moved on to the most difficult pesky heater hose. Notice the amount of room I have to work here. That's because all the steering components and brake booster and master cylinder are over on the opposite side of the engine bay. So right hand drive is a huge advantage here. I will gladly give up drive through and ATMs for this. For left hand drive, you may have better luck going down here between the frame and the body. I'll still have to move some stuff to get back there like this wiring. So looking back, under the intake manifold here, you'll see there's a metal tube. And at the end of that tube, going to the head, is the pesky heater hose. Or PHH, as Kenneth would say. Remember this? And this must be the original because look at the clamps. So 28 years old. And this metal tube goes up around the back of the engine and connects to this hose, which goes to the um, heater valve. Now there is a somewhat easier alternative using 5 8 inch hose. What some people do to eliminate the PHH is go straight from the block, skip the entire metal line, and connect the other end of the 5 8 inch hose right to the heater valve. But the only thing is, the hose, it's not very flexible. So you'll have a big loop that has to go out and around to line up at the heater valve. But that's the easy way to bypass the pesky heater hose. But speaking of bypass, I will be bypassing the rear heater. There's a hose there that goes to a metal line, which can't even be seen from here. But that line is very corroded and the transmission has to be removed to replace it. I'll show the rear heater bypass later, but let's get back to this pesky heater hose. You can see the factory clamp is all rusty. So I'm twisting the pin counterclockwise, and instead of the pin coming out, it's just unraveling the entire clamp. But that works as well. Now that I have completely mangled that factory clamp, let's go up to the other end of this metal line, 
and we have one of these guys to remove and then one of those screw clamps. Next I loosened the lower clamp on the curved hose and with a little lube the screw clamp on the upper end actually came off without breaking then removed the hose. I did remove this uh, upper bolt holding the metal line to the intake and that allowed some play to help remove the hose. Before I mess with the pesky heater hose, I don't want to get ahead of myself again like I did with the radiator hose and have to do it twice. So let's go up top and get this side of the rear heater bypass done. This metal pipe here with the X will be eliminated. And so will all this because I won't need this metal pipe to split off for the front and rear heaters anymore. That lower one branches to the rear. And there's a better look at that rusty corroded hard line that goes down the firewall and runs above the transmission. And that's one of two lines for rear heat that I'll be bypassing. Should I ever drop the trans, I'll replace and plumb them back in, but those lines are a time bomb when they get this bad. And here's the other rear heater hard line on the opposite side of the engine, hiding behind that hook there. You can see it's not much better. So do yourself a favor and have a look at those lines because you'd never know they were back there if you weren't looking for them. Next, I removed the two hoses and the small curved section of metal hard line on the other side of the heater valve that I showed earlier with the yellow X's on them. All right. I got these removed, that wasn't too bad, but now I need to get this metal line that splits for the front and rear heat. And I got the clamp off of the upper hose for the front heater core, but that lower one for the rear is way back there. What I've been doing is using a big flathead and pressing against the metal pipe and onto the clamp to rotate it around counterclockwise, enough to where I can grab it with some pliers. Next I used a long flathead to push the hoses off from the metal pipe. Some lube definitely helped because they were stuck on after 28 years. This lower hose for uh, the rear heat just does not want to let go. Eventually the hose separated from the pipe. There it is folks, finally, now. Uh, the next thing is I need to get the hose off of the pipe that goes into the firewall. And that pipe is part of the heater core, which can get damaged pretty easily if I'm not careful. I sprayed it with lube and let it soak, but there wasn't enough space to be able to get any kind of grip or leverage on the hose to pull it off. If this pipe wasn't here, I could get to that heater core hose on the firewall a lot easier. I might as well remove the pipe anyways uh, because it'll give me more room to replace the PHH. First I got the heater valve out of the way since it was only two easy to reach 10 millimeter bolts. Then I got to work with a 12 millimeter ratcheting wrench on the second hard to reach bolt that held the metal pipe in place. This bolt is not going back in. It took forever to remove this guy. But now the pipe is completely unbolted from the engine. It's only attached to the pesky heater hose still. Next I tried to remove the pipe from the pesky heater hose. But of course that was also much harder than it should have been due to the lack of space and just the fact that these rubber hoses have been clamped on for 28 years. It's off. I have some words to share with Toyota on how they designed this cooling system. I grabbed an X-Acto blade and I'm just cutting away at this hose so I can hopefully pull it off easier. It shouldn't be this hard. Now I'm using a flathead to try and rotate the clamp clockwise. None of these clamps have been facing the right direction to make them easy to grab. Finally got this thing spun around and now I can finally get to it and grab it with some pliers. And there it is. I will not be reusing this clamp for sanity reasons. 
And here's the other half of the pesky heater hose that I cut. Good riddance. Next, I got to work cutting the hose on the firewall that was stuck on the pipe for the heater core, being extremely careful not to put any deep scratches or bends in the pipe because the last thing I want to do is replace the heater core on this 80. After I finally got it removed, I went back with a towel and wiped up all the oil I sprayed back there before I got out the new hoses, since oil degrades rubber over time. So here it is, the infamous pesky heater hose. If you're brave enough to tackle this thing, I'll have a part number for you in the description. When it comes to lubing up these new hoses to help them slide on easier, I just get a can with a little bit of coolant in the bottom because coolant isn't going to degrade the rubber like an oil-based product. And uh, just give it a little dip. Check out this guy. It's a constant torque clamp. I walked into Napa and said, I want a clamp I'll never have to tighten again. And they're like six bucks each, but I don't want to do this again. So I have two in place there. And now I can slip this metal line back on. Easier said than done. All right, I'm gonna need two hands. Bam, that looks beautiful. And then up here, um, I'm gonna hold off on bolting this back up and putting this hose on for just a minute. I don't like that this line for the rear heater down here is just gonna be left open and that side will be the same. I don't want debris and dirt and bugs going down there and ending up in the rear heater core. So I'm gonna block off those lines using some old wheel bolts I had laying around and a couple of old hose clamps. This hose does two things at once. It bypasses the rear heater lines by eliminating the metal tube and it replaces the smaller metal tube and two small hoses. So everything that was marked with a yellow X. That eliminates a lot of pieces and parts where a leak could happen. I couldn't find this anywhere in the US. I had to order it from Amaya, no, uh, Amayama.com. I'll have the part number in the description if you want to search it. I have a constant torque clamp here coming off of the heater core. Then this hose wraps around and will go into the heater valve. Like that. Oh yeah. Here's a look at the uh, wheel bolt I used to plug the line going to the rear heater core. I face the clamp this direction because it's kind of tight over there. But I am going to need a long extension to clear this valve cover here. So I can tighten that guy down. So I need a constant torque clamp here. And I have to bolt this back on and install this short curved hose. So here is the hose I need to go from the metal line to the heater valve. It has this little protective shield on it. Notice I'm not bothering tightening any clamps until I get everything in place. Now that all these hoses are in place and connected, I bolted down the metal pipe, heater valve, and tightened all of the constant torque clamps. And definitely can't forget about these on the pesky heater hose and reattach the transmission dipstick tube to the intake. Now I'm removing the hoses on the return side. And just like before, they're fused to the brass T-fitting and the heater core pipe after 28 years. I had to end up cutting them with the X-Acto blade as well. I've got the heater core on top here, and this goes to the rear heater, which I'll be blocking off and those two teed into this return pipe here with this brass T fitting. So this is where the universal 5 8 inch hose will be used. I cut a piece of the 5 8 inch hose about nine inches long and went from the heater core to the return pipe. Then tightened both ends with constant torque clamps. That was pretty easy. And I stuck a wheel bolt in the hose for the rear heater core just like I did on the other side. And now, moving on down to this hose. 
Unfortunately, this hose is discontinued. It's shaped to go around the pair system, which is for emissions. But Toyota did away with this after a couple years, so most models will just have one big metal line that goes all the way to the thermostat housing. So I can get rid of this and upgrade to the newer metal line or use some more universal 5 8 inch hose here. For the sake of simplicity and time, I'm going with the universal hose. I haven't researched at all on how to delete the pair system or how it will affect emissions or performance. Unfortunately, the universal hose wasn't able to follow the shape of the preformed OEM hose. So I had to find the right balance of letting it bow out enough to stay out of the way of the other components and away from the hot metal pipes for the EGR without having it kink at the bends where it went over the ends of the hard lines. I've reused the OEM clamps on this hose since there was plenty of room to wiggle them on. I pulled off part of the pair system to make more room to reinstall the radiator shroud and the fan. Next up is this hose and it goes from the water outlet on the front of the cylinder head to the radiator. I need needle nose vice grips for the lower clamp. Like so many others, this hose was also stuck on after 28 years. Here's a better look at that hose now that it's installed. It goes right down to there. There are two more coolant hoses to replace and they connect to the bottom of the throttle body, so it has to be removed. While the throttle body is removed is the ideal time to replace the valve cover gasket and spark plug gaskets, which I already did in a separate video. I'll leave that part out to keep this one short, but check the description for that how-to video if you want to take care of everything while you have it apart. I recommend it. First, I need to remove this rubber intake tube. And these clamps are held tight with 10 millimeter bolts that also have a Phillips head on them. I need some room to slide this off now, so the air box lid has to come off. Pull the intake hose very carefully because they do get brittle with age. You can see somebody tried to pry it from the throttle body with what looks like a flathead at some point and it just chipped off. Now I have all these vacuum lines to disconnect. There's five on the top there and a couple of sensors to unplug here. These rubber lines were probably more flexible many years ago. So I had to be very careful disconnecting them to avoid cracking them. Lightly gripping them with pliers and giving them a twist helped break them free from the nipple. There were two more small lines in the back that I forgot to show earlier. I'll get this big one in a minute. All four are disconnected up there. And now I can see one bolt there and the other lower bolt there. I'll need a long extension for those. After loosening the lower bolts, I carefully removed them with a magnet so they wouldn't fall. Then remove the two upper bolts and put a towel over the valve cover to avoid scratches from the throttle body. Now, go down under the intake. This hose right here is attached to the bottom of the throttle body. First, I'm gonna grab that clamp and rotate it clockwise a little bit. Then, I'll be able to get some pliers on it. These needle nose were long enough to grip the clamp and I was able to grab it just enough to loosen it a little to rotate it clockwise where I can grab it with some bigger pliers and pull it off. Then I was able to pull the hose from the head. The other hose clamp I need to remove is right here. Then I was able to remove the throttle body. Here is one of the hoses I need. Uh, this one goes from the back of the throttle body down to the cylinder head, just to the left of the pesky heater hose. And this short hose with the protective cover on it also attaches to the throttle body and this one comes out forward. First, I removed the old gasket, cleaned the mounting surface and installed the new gasket. Then I cleaned the throttle body and installed a new coolant hose on the back side and the new coolant hose on the front side. I'll have those part numbers in the description. Then I got the throttle body in place, connected the front coolant hose, 
and reinstalled the four mounting bolts, torqued to 15 pound feet, reconnected the vacuum lines, plugged in the sensors, reinstalled the intake tube, airflow meter, and air box lid, and the last two vacuum lines on the valve cover. Don't forget to go down here again and clamp the bypass hose onto the nipple on the head. And I took this ground wire off for more room to work, so I need to bolt it back on to the intake manifold. Now, with the pet cock closed, it was time to refill the cooling system with Toyota Red Coolant. I added about two gallons. Next, I pulled the 80 onto ramps to elevate the front and burp the cooling system of any air bubbles by running the engine with the radiator cap off. The engine must reach operating temperature for the thermostat to open and circulate coolant, so this might take a while. In the meantime, I checked the hoses for any leaks. As the coolant level in the radiator dropped from air escaping, I topped it off with more coolant and added coolant to the reservoir as well. After I was sure I didn't have any leaks, I reinstalled the skid plate. And that's it. This is one of many videos featuring America's cheapest 80 series Land Cruiser imported from Japan. It was neglected, but I'm bringing it back to spec. And now the coolant hoses should be good for another 25 years. Do me a favor and give this video a thumbs up if you found it helpful and consider subscribing for more how-to videos and project vehicle updates here at the Sixth Gear Garage. Thanks for watching.